Good afternoon. It's great to see everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Ryan. I am from Meta, and I'll be talking today about building and running a diversity-focused pre-internship program for SRE. So my talk today is ultimately about helping to ensure a healthier, stronger future for our industry, as well as uh, being a lemons to lemonade story about pandemic-based work. I'm going to talk about the problem that we have at Meta, how we chose to address it, and give you a blueprint for what I, we've done and hope that you can use too. And of course, the blueprint involves open source software. So I'd like you to leave this talk today with an understanding of what we've done and hopefully some inspiration to maybe try something similar at your organization. More on that later. So I'm a production engineer at Meta. Production engineering is essentially what we call SRE. I've been at Meta for 13 years and in this industry for over 20 years. And in that time in my industry, I've seen SRE, Site Reliability Engineering, called many different things at many different places. And so I'm going to use terms like SRE and production engineer interchangeably, but your organization might call it something else. I've put some of those job titles, you know, there's things like DevOps or uh, you know, cloud engineer, various other types of titles that people may have, but they all involve the same core skills of reliability, monitoring, troubleshooting, incident management, and those concepts and skills transcend time, they transcend job titles and organization. <clears throat> It's no secret that the diversity in the tech industry, especially gender and ethnic diversity, is quite bad. Uh, this is true at Meta as well, and has been true for a long time. And what has changed is the willingness of companies and society at large to start addressing this in a real way. So as you can see, and this is from our officially published uh, diversity report, at Meta, three quarters of tech employees are men and over 90% are either uh, white or Asian. Uh, we've established concrete company-level goals for improving our diversity and published those goals publicly. I think five or 10 years ago, we might have thrown up our hands and said, this is too big of a problem, we can't do anything about it, but not anymore. Also, we're not just trace chasing some arbitrary metric here. Uh, to quote from our annual diversity report, we believe that Connecting the world takes people with different backgrounds and points of view to build products that work better for everyone. This means building a workforce that reflects the diversity of the people that we serve. To improve diversity in any significant way, we have to bring more diverse people into this industry early in their careers. But doing that is not easy. So you might think, well, okay, just go out there and send our recruiters to colleges and schools that have more diverse student populations uh, and have them recruit uh, SRE talent from there. But it turns out that doesn't work. So why is that? Well, there's four main problems that we've found. The first one is that SRE is not well known as a career path. So for example, many uh, colleges will have a software engineering degree, right? And they know they get a degree in this, they could get a job as a software engineer. But there's no site reliability engineering degrees or anything like that. And most students that are even going through a technical program just don't know that this is a field that employs thousands of people across the world. Second is that the concepts of SRE, the foundational knowledge uh, like you know, Linux and databases, operating systems, is not taught consistently uh, throughout schools. So even if they are, even if students are interested in this, it's very likely they don't have a chance to take a course uh, in any of these concepts. Now the third problem is that students lack interview skills. And this is a very common thing. Now if you don't have access to a large, you know, or a tech company to do interviews at, you're probably never going to practice and you can do things online, but it's not the same. And if you don't know how to do a coding interview or other types of tech interviews, you're going to have a hard time getting a job. And then finally, the issue of access. This idea that you can't be what you can't see. In most schools, students have never 
uh, no student has ever gone to work for a large tech company like Meta or Google or Amazon. Um, and so they don't have examples. People just don't understand that this is even a, a possibility. That's for somebody else, and it's not it's beyond them. So these are the kind of core problems that we're facing here, trying to increase diversity in early career hiring. So how does it work in practice? Well, at Meta, most early career hires are former summer interns, and a large number of them are from top uh, computer science schools. And how does that work? Well, so we send our recruiters to these top CS schools. Uh, some number of students pass the interview. They get hired on as interns at Meta. And then, in turn, uh, many of them will have successful internships. So they go back to their schools. Uh, they also join Meta as full-time employees. And when they go back to their schools, now they're examples for the other students. So the students are able to see, like, oh, well, there's, you know, there's Andrew. He got an internship at Meta. You know, oh, I could do that, right? He's, and they also get tips. Uh, they're able to coach each other on how to pass the interviews and what working at these companies is like and what the expectations are. And those are extremely powerful network effects that over time create these self-reinforcing networks where these schools get a greater pr proportion of students at work at these large tech companies. Now, I have nothing against these, these schools. I work with these, uh, many of these graduates every day. I come from uh, such a school myself. But they limit the diversity of the industry because we are limited by the diversity of these schools that uh, the population of, of these schools that we're recruiting from. So we need to get sort of bust out of this cycle a little bit. <clears throat> we decided that to do that, the best leverage point was to help students get internships, ideally at Meta, but if not, at some other tech company. And we decided to do this by creating a pre-internship program. Uh, basically, we would rec recruit a diverse group of about 100 college students. Uh, like in the sophomore range, since usually students are juniors when they get their, uh, their main internship, and prepare them for an SRE internship at Meta. The fellowship aspect of this program is important. Our interns are actual full-time Meta employees for the, while they're there for the summer. Uh, and as employees, we can't and don't discriminate or uh, be, legally favor anyone uh, based on their gender or ethnicity. But a fellowship is legally considered a scholarship. And there are no restrictions on the criteria that you can place on who gets a scholarship. So our fellows would not be Meta employees. And we would get a partner to administer the program and disperse the fellowship funds. This gives us more flexibility in recruiting diverse participants. <clears throat> All right, so what would such a program look like? Uh, we decided that our program needed to combine the three major aspects of what we think it takes to become a successful uh, SRE. The first is knowledge, so the basic foundational knowledge of the job. This includes the technical building blocks of uh, an SRE career, things like Linux, uh, coding, uh, databases, and troubleshooting techniques. The second is what I'm sort of vaguely calling SRE culture. Uh, things like the you know, ideas around release management and reliability, service level agreements, uh, incident management, all these things that kind of are the, the bread and butter of how we approach our jobs. And then finally, mentorship. Going back to you can't be what you can't see, it's very important that students, when they're starting out in this new career, or even considering this new career, have mentors. They have people that have done it, have been there, who can advise them, who can encourage them, who can be examples for them, and give them tips and tricks on what it takes to get both get into and sort of stay be successful in the industry once they get there. So given these three aspects, how can we combine them to make a practical program? So remember, it's early 2021. No one's been to the office for a year at this point. Uh, in fact, they're not even open. We can't even, I can't even get in if I want to. 
so our program had to be fully remote, although from a diversity perspective, I think that that was actually an advantage since it made things easier for people who couldn't travel easily due to their circumstances. And the pandemic made, at the same time, made our company leadership more willing to accept and try out new things. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I think that there would have been more pressure to do this program on site, which would have made starting it much more complicated. So we decided on a 12-week format and to combine technical curriculum, professional mentoring, and regular interview practice. Along the way, every week, we wanted to present our fellows with speakers and panelists from uh, both inside and outside of Meta to give them more perspectives on SRE and engineering as a career. We also wanted them to prepare a final project uh, that would allow them to tie together everything that they had learned and start to build a professional portfolio. And last but not least, uh, we wanted <clears throat> uh, the students to run, uh, work together in teams. So being a successful SRE, whether you're at a big tech company or a small one, requires a lot of teamwork. And working together in a group always, almost always means that you learn more and you learn it faster. So these are the things that we wanted. But how, right? It's February 2021. We, have, we want students starting by June. Uh, but we have no program, no curriculum, no partners. And there's a pandemic raging, and everyone's stuck at home. So what do we do? OK, so you take a hard problem, and you break it down. And we broke this down into three levels of responsibility. The first one being the meta team. Uh, you might think that a project like this needed a large team of people to build it, or the kind of resources that only a very large company has. Not true. Our core team was four people. Uh, a business program manager who ran all the scheduling and handled like, things like the commercials. Uh, we have a mentor coordinator who coordinated our dozen or so mentors. A curriculum coordinator who's in charge of the, making sure that the curriculum was appropriate. And then uh, the program coordinator who sort of did everything else. That was me. Uh, then we also had some other uh, ancillary people, like our executive sponsor, who would, of course, sign checks and occasionally remove roadblocks. Uh, we had recruiting partners and the dozen or so mentors from uh, Meta. And all of us were doing this uh, part-time. So this is not like a full-time job for us. We're all doing it as part of our uh, regular engineering jobs as well. <laughs> the second pillar was curriculum. So we didn't want to, as we mentioned, we didn't have any curriculum, but we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We know there's a lot of really good information out there around Linux and databases and all these concepts. Uh, we were able to get a partnership with the Linux Foundation, uh, who were generous enough to give us access to some of their Linux sysadmin curriculum uh, on a royalty-free basis for this program. And that was a huge Save, uh, save, so thank you to the Linux Foundation, of course, is also the sponsor of this uh, conference. But that was a, a great thing for us, saved us from having to do all that ourselves. And then finally, the fellowship administration partner. As I mentioned, we had to have a third party to do all of the administration of the program and also and disbursement of funds and whatnot. So we looked at a couple of different organizations and we settled on uh, Major League Hacking, or MLH as I'll call them, and they were in charge of recruiting fellows, kind of assembling the curriculum that, uh, per our guidelines, doing the day-to-day -day running of the program, and dispersing the funds to the fellows. Uh, so they're an organization that run, runs hackathons and other sorts of programs like this all around the world for a couple of years, and uh, they have been a good partner to us. So what did the fellowship actually involve? I said it was 12 weeks. Uh, here's the schedule that we used for last year. Now, some of our fellows had never even used basic tools like Git. So we had to start at the very, very beginning um, and then try to introduce them in a very whirlwind, uh, quick ride into everything that we thought an SRE needed to know. So things like you know, bash, uh, databases, containers, testing. Two things I'll call out here. 
two weeks. Uh, week seven was the career week. During career week, we did two things. One is we helped the students prepare their resume and LinkedIn profiles so that they would be able to present themselves better in the job market. And we also did mock interviews with uh, Facebook, or Meta, uh, was Facebook at the time, Meta engineers and gave them the ability, uh, gave them the opportunity to have like a real tech industry interview. And this was great for two things. One, it gave us a, a level, a kind of a level set on where the students were and also gave the students an opportunity to have a real interview at a real tech company, which you know, otherwise they might not be able to have had. So that was super valuable. And then the last four weeks of the program we spent on a final project. And the final project was anything that students wanted to put together that would use all the sort of foundational pieces of technology that they developed. The idea being that in, uh, at the conclusion of the program, now they would have something checked into GitHub that would be under their name that they could point to employers to and say, like, look, this is what I did, I, you know, and get experience with all the, show ex they had experience with all those uh, software technologies. <clears throat> now, since this is an open source focused conference, I think it's important to call out how essential our open source stack was for training new SREs in this program. Now, some of the uh, stack, uh, open source SRE tra training stack that you see here, such as CentOS, uh, GNU, and Python, is used by Meta internally. As you may know, Meta sponsors quite a bit of open source development on, on these tools and uses them extensively internally. <clears throat> for our own proprietary software tools, uh, for example, our system monitoring and, and stats graphing tools, we couldn't use those for training fellows because they aren't employees, remember, and they didn't have access to our internal systems. But fortunately, most of those tools like uh, have open source equivalents. You know, for example, in the time series graphing, you know, we've got Grafana and Prometheus. Um, and I think it's really super cool that we can train students in the discipline of SRE at a very high level. You know, essentially like a this professional level, uh, using entirely open source software. So, uh, really, you know, good call out there for the open source world. <clears throat> Earlier I mentioned the importance of teamwork and getting our fellows to work together in teams. Now, how did that work in practice? Um, so each, we had, as if you recall, we had about 100 students in the program. Each, uh, we had 10 pods. Each pod had about 10 fellows. And then within the pods, they sort of grouped themselves up into like smaller groups. And they'd all day be chatting on Discord and whatnot. And remember, the fellows were not in the same geographic places. They were sometimes not even in the same time zones. Uh, but they would connect every day uh, with their pod, what was called the pod leader, who was uh, someone from MLH that would coordinate a daily stand-up. And they'd work through the day's assignments or you know, the, work, the week's assignments. <clears throat> in addition, once a week or so, each of the fellows, either individually or in small groups, would meet with their mentor from Meta and just get a chance to ask them anything. So some, it could be asking about technical stuff, it could be uh, career stuff, interview tips, really. So we've kind of left it, uh, left it open as far as like what that mentoring relationship would, would, would turn into. So that's the program. What about the results? <clears throat> Well, first off, I'm really proud to say that our fellows worked super hard and they had a great experience. 95% graduated the program, meaning they completed all the modules and stayed until the end. And 77% reported spending 25 or more hours a week on it. So that's really great to see. And we had, in our daily sessions, 95% daily uh, attendance. I think it's a really good... Uh, all these statistics are really good at showing that people were engaged, and they found value from it. But did they understand at the end what SRE was? Did they feel like they could do it? That's the, you know, that's another important thing. And I think there, the answer is a resounding yes. 
So take a look at these numbers, starting in week one when we surveyed the students, and going to week 12 at the end of the program. You can see at the beginning of the program, most of the students didn't know what SRE was, or they don't, uh, they didn't think they were, they had the skills to do it, they didn't even know what the skills were, and they weren't sure it was a great career path. And look at how those numbers change. Basically, everyone that went through this program knows what it takes to be a successful engineer at Meta. And that's awesome. Now, do they want to be? Is that their ultimate career path? You know, we don't, we don't know that. We, you know, it would be great if it was, but I think it's really powerful that we're able to kind of instill that in them, that at least they feel confident that they know what they need to do. <clears throat> And then lastly, kind of like the, uh, I mean, I don't lo love to you know, over-rotate on jobs, but it's, of course at the end of the day, is a program for recruiting and for hiring, and we need to make sure that people are getting jobs. And the answer from that is yes, so far. Uh, our data here, j just as a caveat, isn't quite as good because we had to rely on a combination of surveys and LinkedIn data, but our estimate is about 50% of the fellows from last year, got jobs this summer in some kind of a tech, uh, some kind of a tech job. Twenty-three percent reported having SRE type roles, where you know SRE was in the title or a very sim you know, similar title. And over half reported using those SRE skills in their jobs. So remember, going back to that first slide, you know this is a big tent here. If it, you may be using these skills, like you know, CI, CD, or you know, databases, or whatever, but your job title may be something, you know, something else. And 90% said the fellowship gave them advantages in the interview process, which I think is really good to hear. It means that our training was working. And when those fellows went into interviews, they had a leg up because they had gone through this program and had this kind of practice. Uh, and there's some of the companies Sorry, they have some of the companies that uh, we've got confirmed SRE job placements at, so including Meta, so it's very exciting. <clears throat> so we ran the pro we're running the program again this year. We're currently actually in week four uh, with another hundred fellows. Um, but what needed improvement? What did we find that we could do better? Um, the number one feedback that we got from the fellows was that they didn't understand the why of what they were learning until later in the summer uh, when they started their project. So this year, we're trying to make the project the focus of the fellowship and making the curriculum support that. So for example, at the same time the students are learning about uh, containerization, for example, they could be dockerizing their own project so they can deploy it in the cloud. The second learning was that we needed more interview practice. Uh, so we're adding weekly, we've added uh, weekly modules to allow the students to continue to practice uh, mock interviewing. You know, I don't love, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I, you know, I don't love to make a focus purely on, on interviewing. I, you know, I'm much more, I'd rather people learn stuff, but the fact is, it's important. And you have to do it, and if you can't interview well, you can't get into this industry, and if you can't get into this industry, you can't go anywhere. So um, we have to spend time on it. Um, third one is <clears throat> trouble spots. So with a program this large, 100 fellows, 10 pods, uh, numerous mentors and pod leaders, uh, it was really easy to have a couple of people here and there slip through the cracks, or indeed sometimes like an entire pod would uh, just kind of be lagging or not getting a certain concept. You know, that is one downfall of the, of the sort of group project. You know, if no one of the 10 people can kind of gets it, then they all kind of just stuck. So this year we're instituting weekly check-ins and weekly surveys that will make sure that if we, that we catch these earlier. So if there's kind of trouble spots with individuals or, or pods, we're able to address them and no one's feeling left behind. And then lastly, we're going to be much more careful this year to provide follow-up support and uh, tracking through the recruiting process, uh, especially at Meta. So this is a little bit 
uh, embarrassing, but you know, we didn't have a good integration between our program and our internal recruiting. So when it came time last year at the end of the program for all the fellows to apply for jobs, we were sort of scrambling to, to like find out who they were and locate them through our applicant tracking system and whatnot. So we're going to do a better job on that this year and also uh, hopefully for the people that don't end up working at Meta, we'll have a much better handle on where they ended up and, and what they're doing. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, this is a recruiting program. We do uh, need to see results. We want to see results, and we want to know that it's working. If it's not, we want to make it better. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, as engineers, we're always thinking to ourselves when we build something, how do I scale this? How do I scale at 10x? How do I scale at 100x? Right? We're really proud of our work here, but this is still only 100 students a year. If we're successful again this year, uh, which we hope we are, we'd like to grow this program further inside of Meta, hopefully to, uh, to Europe um, and elsewhere. But we can't grow to 10 times the size or 100 times the size. So what opportunities do we have to scale this? Well, for the first opportunity to scale, I'd like to refer back to the diagram that I used earlier about how we have these schools with their self-reinforcing network effects that bring us qualified candidates year after year. One of my hopes is that we can use this program to seed new schools and effectively be able to create schools that you know, didn't have these network effects. Now, if we can get a couple people and in and get them as interns and get them as full-time employees, we can start to seed new schools. And we know this is possible. Um, it's just challenging. And secondly, we'd like to run this program or something like it at other organizations. So I'm hoping there are people out there watching this talk right now, uh, whether in person or virtually, that have authority over hiring and uh, budgets and have similar diversity goals at your organizations. So we'd like to talk to you. Come chat with uh, uh, me in the hall during uh, after the conference, after the talk. Um, <clears throat> on the last slide, we'll have some contact info where you can reach us. Uh, there's also, I will point out, a couple of folks from MLH in the room as well. You can go talk to them. And finally, uh, you know, we're thinking about trying to kind of open source this program in the same way that, as I meant, you know, showed you that open source SRE stack. There's, there's no secrets, right? I mean, this is, you can go out already and find most of this content somewhere, right? Like, there's plenty of content on how to use Linux and how to use databases and how, all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, bring this program all together and giving, adding the mentorship piece in and adding the interview training and stuff like that, that's what, where really the magic is. This is an industry problem. It's not just Meta's problem, it's a problem everywhere. Uh, the logistics might be tricky, but we know that for our industry to change and improve in the long term, we have to work together. And I am happy to say I can't give any, uh, I can't say anything officially yet, but I, I am happy to say that we've got some real strong uh, interest from other companies that is definitely happening, and you will see something like this at at least one other company in the next year, and hopefully multiple. So things are happening, but... Uh, you know, we can always use more. <clears throat> now, how can you help if you're interested, if this excites you? Uh, first off, hire our fellows. So I know uh, most people watching this talk are looking for people. And they have open positions for full-time engineers, and many of you hire interns as well. So if you see the MLH Production Engineering Fellowship sponsored by Facebook or sponsored by Meta, on a resume or LinkedIn, give them a reach out. They've had some good training, I would like to think. Um, and secondly, as I mentioned on our last slide, you can support a similar project at your company. Lots of things appear impossible until they've been done. Well, we did it, and you can too. We're giving away the blueprint. We will work with you. We will tell you what we did. We'll give you, you know, every, every sort of contact we have. This is nothing, you know, we're not trying to, like, steal all the good people here. We just want to bring more uh, diverse people into this industry. 
So <clears throat> thank you. Uh, we are, so as I mentioned, we are running the program again this year. Uh, if you want to uh, if you want to get some uh, like whatever collateral on it, you can follow uh, Major League Hacking. Uh, these are some quotes from some people that have been through the program uh, last year. And I'll be happy to take questions either in the room or uh, virtually. So anyway, thank you very much, and hope you have a great uh, week in Austin. <laughs>
Yeah, you, you bring up, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? Like this, you know, and we talk about that, I talked about that in the slide, uh, in my slides, where this is something that doesn't have much awareness in the industry or, or in schools. This is a field that people just don't know about. Um, so I can give you some partial answers. Uh, the, the, the thing you should walk away from is this is still a work in progress. How to sell sort of this, this idea of like SRE and DevOps as a, as a career. We're still trying to like figure that out and trying to figure out how to make that more inclusive. And I think even for this year, we, there's more things that we can do to kind of you know, explain, which we'll do in 2023 to explain like, and, and make it just seem less threatening or scary, you know? Um, probably in our case, uh, the meta name helps a lot, right? Just because people are like, well, I don't know what, maybe I don't know what this is, but like, gosh, a job at meta, or a chance for a job at meta sounds pretty good, so maybe I'll just, you know, take a, I think that's what a lot of the students in our first uh, session did. We also had some informational sessions throughout the, uh, last three, mo three months through MLH, so we'd like have these open sessions where we'd have somebody from Meta like talk about the team and talk about the program, and I don't know, maybe we've got some videos and other stuff, but that's an area that I'm very, uh, I'm very passionate about and I want to get better at because, yeah, I mean, like you have to look back even bef in the funnel before the people that apply into the program of, you know, how many, pe how many diverse people are looking at this application page and saying, I can't do that, and they're not even applying, right? And that's, yeah, so we, we, wanna, we, wanna, do, we wanna do better. It's just gonna be a continual process of improvement there. Um, you just sparked a question just that came up on that last one. On the, the, the job role description, have you, um, had that done, th have brought through a, a diversity edit, like a, 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 a you know editing team of people with with diverse mm -hmm. backgrounds and skills to look for things that might get people to go, oh no, and walk away from it. Uh, for our full time jobs, do you mean, or for, for the, the for the oh for the fellowship? Um, I I don't know that we did that specifically. Um, I mean, so. I mean, I know that I reviewed it and all of our core team reviewed it, but uh, yeah, I don't know that we had it specifically reviewed by like a, a diversity or inclusion expert, but it's, that's a good, uh, that is a good idea. And that's definitely, like, like I said, something that we'll be looking at for um, next year to see how we can improve, get more applicants, get more, you know, a broader base of, of people. And honestly, part of that is also things like this where we publicize the program and get the word out so that pe more people know about it, it becomes, eventually it becomes a thing, and people just know it's, it's there, and then they're excited about it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, there's nothing online, so I guess that's it, but thank you for right. speaking, and thank you all thank for you. coming.